Hello and welcome to today's Wild Lunch Wednesday. My name is Charlotte and I will be your host for today's event. Today we're going to be taking you virtually into the field as we go to the Philippines in search of pangolins. But before we begin and I introduce today's scientist, I'm going to share my screen with you one more time just to show you how you can take part in today's event. So we really welcome your questions during the event and the way to share your questions with us is to go to Pigeonhole. So simply go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1826. That's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1826. And there you will be able to type in your question and we will receive it over here. Now I'm I'm hoping there are going to be lots of questions. So the way I'm going to be choosing them is I'll be choosing the most popular questions because on Pigeonhole you can also upvote other questions. So if there are other things that have been asked that you really like, give them a little tick and that means they'll go to the top of the list and they will be the ones that we try to answer first during the event. Now, as I mentioned, we are taking you virtually to the Philippines today uh, as we go in search of pangolins. And to accompany us and tell us more, we're joined by ZSL scientist Lucy Archer. Lucy is uh, currently in the midst of doing her PhD um, and she's been out to the Philippines several times. So she's the perfect person to tell us more. Thank you so much for joining us, Lucy. No worries. Thanks, Charlotte, for having me. Now, before we um, go into sort of what a, pal a pangolin is, because some people may not know, um, if someone was to ask you to describe your fieldwork experiences in just three words, what would you say? Oh, that's tough. Um, it's, it's tough to summarise in three words, but um, I think I would say it's hot. It's really hot. Um, so for average of around um, 29, 30 degrees in the dry season. Um, it's quite exhausting. Um, so the team and I spend long days um, out in the field, um, which in the heat is quite tiring. Um, but it's also really magical. Um, so there's something really special about the region, um, which we're going to tell you a bit more about today, um, where I'm working. Um, and there's a reason it's been voted the uh, world's best island uh, multiple years running. So it's, um, it's quite a special place. Ah, interesting to know. Brilliant. Well, I, lo I love those words. I was getting a bit worried by word two because it wasn't sounding appealing, but um, <laughs> but magical sounds sounds great. Well, we are going to be focusing on your fieldwork today, um, which is all to do with the pangolin. For anyone who's not aware of these scaly animals, what are they and why are they important? Yeah, so as you say, um, pangolins are strange, um, but they're really cool. Um, so you might hear them described as um, walking pine cones um, because they have this covering of epidermal scales um, that are made out of keratin, which is the same protein found in our fingernails. Um, and they also have really long tongues, um, which is handy because they don't have any teeth. Um, so they use their tongues to find their prey. Um, and so they're a very unusual mammal, um, but they're really important. So um, the species that I study, the Philippine pangolin, is critically endangered. Um, so its um, numbers are really dropping around the world. So, so it's really important to study these species and learn more about them so we can actually conserve them. They do look absolutely fan fantastic. Um, with, the, with the pangolin, as I mentioned, you've been in the Philippines trying to find out more about it. Where, whereabouts in the Philippines have you been carrying out your field work? So, um, so the Philippine pangolin is actually, although it's, only, it's endemic to the Philippines, it's actually endemic just to this one region within the Philippines, um, which is called Palawan province. Um, and this is a province that you can see here on the screen. Um, and it's made up of around 1,700 islands and islets. Um, so you can see it here on the screen. So this large island here is mainland Palawan, um, but there are lots and lots of mini islands and tiny little islets that surround it. And have you been, have you visited all of these islets, Lucy? <laughs> Not every single one. Um, so we've been um, to this, to the mainland Palawan, um, and we've been to Linapacan that you can see there on the screen, Cunion, Busuanga, and Coron. So we've been to these main okay. ones and also Dumara and Araceli. But it's, um, it's really interesting place biogeographically, um, because although it's part of the Philippines, the animals you find there um, are more akin to the fauna you might find perhaps on Borneo. Um, and that's because Palawan sits on what we call the Thunder Shelf, um, which is the area that comprises Borneo, Java, Sumatra, 
um, and other areas like the Malaysian Peninsula. Um, so during periods of low sea level, these islands were probably all once connected, um, which is why the island of Palawan is actually more similar to that of Borneo than it is to the rest of the Philippines. Oh, sound, it does sound magical, Lucy. <laughs> you're, you're definitely selling it to me. Um, so you're carrying out your, your research um, there in, in Palawan. What exactly are you trying to find out? So in general, pangolin wide, we know very little about them. Um, and this, that, that's for all eight species, really. Um, and that's because they're um, difficult to study in the wild, essentially. So most, most species are primarily nocturnal. Um, they're solitary, they don't vocalise, and some, like the Philippine species, um, are semi-arboreal, which means they spend some of their time up in the trees and some of the time um, on the ground. Um, so if you walk through, imagine walking through a forest um, at night, um, trying to find something that's up high up in the trees that doesn't make a sound, um, it's very, very tricky. Um, so we don't really have much knowledge um, at all um, on the Philippine penguin, just a few studies here and there. So this study is really trying to kind of create a baseline um, baseline data set where we can kind of look across their range at where they're still existing and what the threats that they face across the region are. So re yeah, really vital to know where they are and, and maybe sort of how how many, because until you know that information, you can't start sort of conserving and protecting them. Yeah. Exactly. It's quite hard to protect something where you don't know where it exists or where, where the, you know, the more important places are to be protected. Absolutely. Well, I'm very pleased to see that we've got lots of questions coming in. So thank you very much. Keep sending them in, everyone, um, and keep upvoting your favourites as well. Um, so we've got a couple of sort of top questions at the moment. Um, and one of them is, how did you get into researching pangolins? Which is a good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, um, so I'm on um, a PhD program, um, the London uh, DTP, and as part of that, um, you kind of you spend six months kind of exploring um, different institutions um, to kind of and, and explore projects. Um, and as part of that, we came to the Decel, uh, to the Institute of Zoology, um, and I got talking to um, my supervisor Sam Turvey, who um, knows Carly Waterman, who um, works at IAZ and is the pangolin technical specialist there um, at ZSL. Um, and I kind of heard about um, the Philippine pangolin from, I mean, I knew about pangolin in general anyway, but um, had never really heard much about the Philippine pangolin because it's sort of one of the species you don't really hear that much about. Um, and I kind of started talking to them a bit more and realized that actually we know so little about this species. Um, so I became intrigued and wanted to learn more um, and thought it could make a really cool study. Um, and it was kind of at the time where ZSL was starting to think about setting up a, a pangolin project for the Philippine pangolin. So it all kind of came together at the perfect time. And I was just very lucky to be in the right place at the right time, I think. It sounds sounds like perfect timing, Lucy. And that probably takes us quite nicely on to um, my next question for you, which is how you set about finding out more about pangolins in, in the Philippines, sort of what has your research involved? Yeah, so um, to try and create this kind of baseline data set, um, we wanted to really visit as many places as possible across the region to really get this broad level of overview of where they're still present. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're really difficult to find in their wild environments. Mm -hmm. So carrying out ecological surveys, for example, one, we don't have the methods yet to be able to do that. Um, so if we were to undertake traditional um, transect surveys, it would probably take years and years and years, and you may or may not get any data. Um, so instead, we have taken an approach um, where we decided to speak to the people that are living alongside pangolins. Um, so we wanted to speak to as many people as possible um, from across the region to find out if they still see pangolins, if so, when they last saw a pangolin, where did they last see a pangolin? Um, and this is what we call or define as local ecological knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And this we could describe as the first hand information, if you like, that um, the first hand knowledge that a person holds of their local environment. So um, we interviewed around 1,200 households from across the region um, and kind of built up this picture um, of where they're still existing and where, where last sightings were higher. 
that sounds incredibly useful because because you're right otherwise how would you know where to start I guess it'd be a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack um so so that allowed you to gather all of this information but as you mentioned it did involve traveling across Palawan is it an easy place to to get around um some locations are easy to get to others not so much um some of the more inland villages that we visited um so Palawan is quite a Palawan mainland is quite thin and it has this amazing mountain running up its spine mm. um but as you kind of get to the more inland areas lots of the roads become a lot more bumpy and dusty um and yeah you can see that this is a that was an image I took of um the uh, the mountains from from a from the air um and yeah some of these the dusty roads and lots of interesting fridges um <laughs> so I think we traveled by every means possible so um yeah we this was our our um navi we called him our, our car um and we went by um boat by car um by bike we'd have to walk to some places um so I think yeah we we pretty much used every means of covered, transport you possibly can. <laughs> covered them all. But um, yeah. these roads, Lucy, that, I mean, this this bridge, for example, looks a little precarious. Yeah, there were quite a few um, bridges like this that we had to cross. Um, some of which, um, yeah, you sort you just close your eyes as you're driving over them. <laughs> uh, we Did you have a, a method for making sure they yeah. were safe as well. yeah we'd have a um our so, yeah this was the protocol which basically existed of getting out um going and jumping on the bridge <laughs> and assessing how sturdy it was <laughs> brilliant brilliant well you you clearly made it you came back in in one piece which is what's what's important and um, how aware were local people of of pangolins when you were talking to them in in these surveys was it an animal that they they were seeing often that they were aware was there yeah actually um I mean I kind of had no idea before we went out kind of what the level of knowledge would be um but um it was I was actually really surprised it was actually really really high um so around 87 percent of respondents um could recognize a pangolin and provide more information of a pangolin and 70 percent of people that we spoke to reported that they'd seen a pangolin within their actual village um so yes the households we spoke to could tell us so much about them and the habitats that they're living in and the threats that they're facing um mm. so so that was really positive um but unfortunately the on the kind of on the negative side um what people were telling us were that they do see them, but the sightings aren't regular. So, for example, only 19% of people um, had reported sightings in the past couple of years. Um, and we uh, we asked lots of questions, for example, on attitudes um, and perceptions of decline. Um, and over 70% of respondents reported that pangolins are now either rare or very rare within their village. Mm. Um, so we've got this kind of positive case where people are still seeing them which is great um but they're not seeing them very regularly and they're and they're reporting declines and that's pretty much across the whole region that that was the case mm. so it's it's clear that definitely that that conservation work is is needed um which brings us nicely on to the the top question at the moment that people would like the answer to which is what are the barriers to conserving the pangolin um i think really it's it's um knowledge at the moment like we do we need more knowledge um on research methods that we can use so so one where they still existing so we can know where we can start looking in more detail but now we kind of know where they exist we need more research to understand how we can actually monitor these populations um so whether that be through camera trap surveys or other um new survey methods and new tech for example um but we need to we need to try that out now um, and actually develop some standardized monitoring methods that we could use to compare populations across the region. Um, another question, Lucy, is is sort of what can we do to to help the pangolins? Are there any uh, projects that we can perhaps you know support in terms of donations or, or fundraising? Yeah, I mean. Um, there's a lot. There's lots of projects um, around the world working on pangolins globally. So if you go to the IUCN Pangolin Specialist Group website, you can see all of the projects globally that um, are happening. Um, but um, for our project, I mean, yeah, definitely. Like we, all, there's always more research that needs to be done, and always, always more funds that are needed. Um, so um, yeah, it'd be great to get some um, 
some trackers out on some of the pangolins to really explore things like their home range and to see what exactly what habitats they're using in more detail um, and that that tech costs money so um so funding is often a um a factor to why yeah more can't be done because we need the money to do it Mm, of course well we will be sharing a link at the end of the event um if you'd like to find out more about zsl's work with with pangolins but also how you can support that and donate as well so thank you for asking about that um, i'm going to come back to a few more of the questions in a minute because that we're definitely going to be um covering them but before we do um lucy you, you mentioned the, the surveys which were crucially important they, they started to give you an idea as to where the pangolins might be um what were the the next steps what did you do then yeah so once we kind of collected this data across the range um the next step was kind of trying to bring in other sort of socio-political factors in to work out where we should actually focus our efforts so so we held a stakeholder workshop and when i say we i mean the ZSL, um, philippines team um, that are working out in, in Palawan. So this was um, us at the stakeholder workshop um, and they brought together representatives from local government units across Palawan, other NGOs, um, protected area managers, um, leaders of indigenous groups, for example. Um, and this brought together a lot of people from across the region um, and we had a two day workshop. Um, and this was really to understand um, factors such as um, local government willingness to be involved in pangolin conservation efforts, um, where other NGOs are working, for example, so we don't duplicate efforts, um, and really just to kind of bring it, bring in and consolidate knowledge um, on the species and to present our LEK results. And this, and we kind of combined our LEK results um, with this two-day workshop, um, and we kind of had like a prioritization scoring system that we used. To, do, to try and work out where the, the best place would be to focus our efforts. Um, and that led us to an area in northern, northeastern Palawan, um, which is where ZSL Philippines are now working. Um, and we're trying now to develop those monitoring methods that I was speaking about earlier. Um, and we're also in the process of trying to designate um, the Philippines' first community-based pangolin conservation area. So we're working with the local community there. Fantastic, because um, Lucy, the, the current top question is what will ZSL do with this, this information? And so um, th these are the, the next steps after having done that survey, having had those meetings as well. Um, it, it's then thinking about w which areas you focus on. Yeah, exactly. So um, so as we speak, um, there's the ZSL Pangolin team um, are working with the local community. Um, so we like over the past year, we've conducted lots of community consultations, more interviews um, at our pilot site, and we've been really um, working with the local community and bringing in things like community mapping to understand at the fine of detail where they're seeing pangolins. Um, and we've been working with the local community to set up um, camera traps across this pilot site. Um, and then the team alongside that are working with the local government to try and um, bring in a new ordinance to designate this as an actual protected area. Um, so this is our kind of first site that we're trialing us at and then the hope is that we can then expand this across the region to other sites and have lots of different community-based pangolin projects across the region. That's really exciting. Well, we'll have a look at those um, camera traps, uh, have a closer look and at some of the results as well from them in a moment. Um, but another question that's um, come in online is what are the current community attitudes to pangolins in, in the region? So you mentioned kind of awareness of, of the pangolins, but um, are local communities sort of supportive of this conservation work? Yeah, it's actually was something we included in our survey was um, how willing people would be to get involved in conservation efforts and how important um, that do they think conservation efforts are. So what importance do they place um, on conserving these species? Um, and it was really high, actually. Um, so generally, um, people were really willing to be involved um, and said that to them cons conserving the species is important they're aware that it's endemic to the Palawan so it's you know it's um it's something special to them to protect that's great and um, I just had to show these photos Lucy of, of the <laughs> the baby pangolin this was one that you you saw yourself yeah we were lucky enough to see this um this baby pangolin so they call it a pangolin pup um and um a community member had um 
come across it um, in a sort of agricultural area not so far away from them and um, so he contacted us and um, so we were lucky enough to go and um, see it and, and um, see it really safely so so we're very lucky <laughs> Fantastic. it's a uh, very cute it's about sort of six inches long um, really small very, yeah. and I mean given, given how sort of elusive they are and, and difficult to see a really um, lucky opportunity to see one for, for yourself in, in person yeah absolutely well, you mentioned camera traps, Lucy, um, and I mean, they're a fantastic resource for, for scientists and conservationists. Um, they allow us to gather a lot of information, but how easy are they to, to set up in the, in the Philippines, in Palawan? Um, it was quite tricky, um, great fun, but tricky. Um, so it involved lots of trekking through dense forest. <laughs> um, so I think we've got a few, a few photos we have. here. Um, so some... So the cameras were sort of spread at about um, a kilometre apart, so not not too far. Um, and some it might take, you know, 20 minutes to get from one camera to the next, whereas others it could take sort of three hours because you might you'd be walking through this this dense forest sort of going under and over trees and roots and vines and things. And then you might get to a, an area of rattan, um, which is really spiny and hard to get through. Um, and you'd have to turn back and go find another way through. Um, so we were trying really hard not to to cut down, not to cut trails as we were going along. So, um, which is which is a good thing to do, but it made it a lot more difficult to get through the forest. Um, so yeah, so you can see on this picture, this is the sort of thing we were. These were our forest highways. We were using um, <laughs> fallen down fallen down tree trunks to get across the forest. Brilliant. And and are there any things you need to sort of be a wary of when when you're in the the forest are there any sort of maybe but, dangerous animals that might be lurking yeah there are no kind of large large carnivores um so we didn't have to worry about that but um there are snakes there are pythons and um, but there are also killer bee nests um which are probably the most scary thing so so yeah this is a, a huge nest um and sometimes we'd this is one we saw on the side of the road but when you come across that in a, a dense forest um it's um yeah you, you want to get away from it quite quickly <laughs> very, very wise very wise and <laughs> um, and Lucy tell me a little bit more about the the people who you were there with because you you couldn't have set up these these camera traps without without the help of others absolutely so it was very much um a team effort and a community-led effort so we had a team um of around um five or six of us um so you can see i think the, the middle picture was yeah that one um, um so this was our kind of original um camera trapping survey team um and um these local guides um were just incredible um so their navigation of the forest was um just unbelievable so we we trained like we, we used them um, gps devices um, and we had, you know, all the tech um, to navigate through the forest. Um, so you can see here um, one of our local guides um, using our GPS. But but in reality, they don't need it um, because they just know the forest like the back of their hands. And they could just once we'd set up all the cameras, um, when we'd go to monitor them, they just knew exactly where they were going and could just navigate directly there. Um, so, yeah, their knowledge was invaluable um, and not just navigating the forest, but actually looking for pangolin signs. Mm. Um, so they would um, they would be able to show us um, what the pangolin scratch marks look like, where potential pangolin feeding spots were, trails in the forest. Um, so yeah, without these guys, they just they wouldn't have been possible. Really useful. And I mean, pangolin scratch marks. We've got an example on on the screen here. I mean, they're not they're not that big. They would definitely be hard to spot. Yeah, sometimes they're really hard to spot. Sometimes you can find like a, a log that's really been rummaged and it's kind of quite a clear indication that they've been there. But others, if you don't kind of have that decaying log. So yes, so here you can see that um, there's definitely been some some activity here, um, lots of digging around. Um, so that's a kind of typical place where we might set a camera. Um, but that you'd be lucky if um, that was in the kind of range that we were so we'd navigate to a point to where we're going to put our cameras and we'd look in a buffer zone around that area and um, so you're lucky if you found a decaying log but if not you'd be really searching for all these tiny scratch marks which is quite hard. <laughs> I can imagine well we're going to um, try and save the last few minutes of the event to get through a few more questions but just before we do um, I think it's important perhaps to to share the results of, of some of this hard work so far um, 
and and some camera camera trap successes because Lucy you have managed to spot pangolins on on the camera traps haven't you we have yeah we've been very lucky and we have had um I think around um 13 of the cameras so far I've got um pangolin captures on which is super exciting um so this is one pangolin here feeding on the side of a tree um so um yeah we've got another one in a that's a sort of the hollowed um tree root um which is um pretty cool um so yeah so oh and this one is a um i don't know if you can see but at the back was a pangolin pup um oh, yeah on this on the mum's tail so um that was very exciting so that's proved that there's um you know pangolins are breeding in this area so that's really helped when we've gone to the local government to say um this we think this should be an area that of importance to protect Brilliant. Well, um, some of the questions we've um, had coming in, Lucy, are, are sort of about your, your methods and how you've been collecting information. And um, one in particular is whether local people are hesitant to talk to you about pangolins because of, of the illegal trade. Um, was that a problem with, with the surveys? No, in general, people are really open to talk and really welcoming. Um, it, yeah, it was amazing, really. Um, people were so willing just to kind of open the doors to the houses and let us in and have a chat about pangolins. Um, alongside the LEK survey, which I haven't really gone into detail here, but we also um, conducted key informant interviews where we were specifically trying to talk to people involved in the pangolin trade. Um, so that was a little bit more tricky to, to find people that would be willing, understandably, to talk about some an issue that's mm. sensitive um, and illegal. Um, but in general, for the LEK survey, people were, were really willing to talk to us. And um, in, in your opinion, Lucy, and I'm sure this probably isn't an easy question to, to answer, but what would be the, the best solution? What, what is the solution to combating um, the, the illegal trade of, of pangolins? Um, yeah, a really tricky um, question. I think it, yeah, it definitely requires a, a global effort because the pangolin trade um, is, is so global. Um, and I think there's, there's kind of the, the two sides to it. There's um, working with local people and engaging them in conservation efforts. But there's all, it, I think it really is ultimately a case of stopping the demand. If the demand wasn't there, um, then these species wouldn't be traded. Um, and so I guess I think the in law enforcement needs to target those higher up the chain um, and not so much the people that are on the ground. Um, yeah. And um, another question that's come in, I'm imagining there are perhaps quite a few people watching who are, who are thinking this all sounds really interesting. They'd really quite like to, to do your, your job. How can an early career conservationist um, get involved in, in pangolin conservation, Lucy? Um, there are lots of groups out there, um, so I would say get in touch um, with the groups that are working on pangolins, um, with us at Zillicel, um, but there are lots out there that are working um, on different pangolin species across the world. Um, contact them and see if there are any ways to get involved, um, volunteering or, or whatnot. Brilliant. So, so lots of opportunities, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, we have come to, to the end of, of the event already. 30 minutes goes very quickly. Um, but Lucy, after giving us sort of this insight into your work um, in Palawan with Philipp um, with pangolins, sort of are you hopeful about their future? Um, I'd say I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I think it's important to understand that the species is not in a good place. Um, it's in urgent need of conservation attention. Um, but I really do believe that local people hold the knowledge that we need to actually protect them um, and that they have the willingness to engage in conservation efforts. So I think if we can find the funds um, and to, to support more community based projects across the region, um, there's definitely definitely a will and a way to bring the species back from the brink. Brilliant. That's really good to know. Well, thank you so much, Lucy, for, for sharing your stories with us. And thank you to everyone for sending in your questions for Lucy as well. We weren't able to tackle them, tackle them all, but we are going to be taking the top five remaining questions um, and putting them in a blog, which we will post tomorrow on the ZSL website. So there's still time to upvote the, the questions that you really want answered. And Lucy will reply to those questions and we'll post the answers in a blog tomorrow for you to be able to read. But right now I'm going to quickly share my screen one last time just to share with you 
Um, some of those links that I mentioned earlier on, so you can find out more about our work at ZSL um, and also how you can do donate to some of our conservation projects, such as the one in the Philippines. But also, we would really like to know what you thought of today's event. So please, if you have a moment, it will only take a few minutes, do fill in our survey monkey um, questionnaire. All you need to do is go to www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash wild lunch and tell us what you thought of it. It will really help us in planning our future events. Um, wild Lunch Wednesdays are a, a mini series of events. So they're happening every uh, Wednesday fortnightly uh, during February and March. So our next one will be at the beginning of March. I think um, it's the 3rd of March, if I remember correctly. And we're going to be finding out about African wild dogs. So I do hope you can join us then. But for now, thank you and goodbye.